Oh, okay. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, sure. You said about the possible difference between synthesized psilocybin and real mushrooms. And because of its chemical nature, right? And I've been eating mushrooms and collecting them in the nature. And my experience is that from some time, uh, even taste trigger the process even more quickly than chemicals come inside. So what about taste and importance of it? Do you think about it? Um, so the, the question is the difference in t uh, onset between mushrooms and synthetic psilocybin right, and, and related to the taste of the mushroom? Right, and subjective. Do you, anybody <coughs> also research kind of taste influence and subjective relations to that? I'm unaware of any, and I, I don't know what role it, it would play. Um, it's possible to absorb substances through the mouth, under the tongue, and through the mucous membrane, so maybe that has something related to your experience. I, I don't know of anybody that's looked at that. Oh, I do want to say, so our psilocybin, we're providing for like $1,800 a gram, which is, still seems like a lot of money, uh, but it's it's like totally analyzed, and it's like, you know, bone pure, and it's, um, so you get 50, you know, 50 doses for 1800 bucks. I don't know if that's a bargain or, or what, but <laughs> anyway, yes. Hi. Um the medical and pharmaceutical industries have pretty roundly failed marginalized communities, especially in terms of the availability of mental health care and psychiatric intervention, which is to say nothing of treatments which require $100 a dose and inpatient care. In terms, I'm not trying to knock the science, but in terms of getting this medicine to the people who need it the most, is the pharmaceutical industry the best place to put it again? I mean, it was already an item in the pharmaceutical industry before. Right. So, well, the, so the number I just quoted to you is going to uh, researchers, and I mean, I think we have kind of like loose bookkeeping. Um, I mean, we need the paperwork for uh, the DEA, like I have to transfer stuff with uh, DEA forms, but in terms of uh, uh, where the, uh, uh, the accounting goes, I, I, I'm not sure about that. But to your specific question, one thing with these studies is that it's anticipated that the people that are going to be taking uh, psilocybin it's only going to be a few sessions, like two, three times. Um, it's not like they're going to be coming back weekly uh, for sessions. So that's at least a model we're working under right now. Um, how do you provide? And really, the pharmaceutical industry is unlikely to ever pick this up. Uh, the only way we're able to do this work now is through private funding. There have been an, several philanthropists who have seen value in this work, and they're really supporting both my laboratory and some of the other studies that are going on. Um, now, to be sure, some of these studies are funded by the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, and so there is some federal money available. But w when it becomes prescribable, you know, how are people who can't afford a high payment going to have access to it? I, I hope that there's some uh, compassionate use uh, available that people will, will have what's available to them as a medicine, you know, without that people won't be excluded because they can't pay for it. That, that's my hope, and I know that the people that are supporting this want to see that too. They just want to get this out, and they're not really interested in making money. So, I hope that answers your question. I, I, I mean, there's a couple of layers to it, so. Um, I have experience with, uh, I, I went through Dr. Mash's clinical trials with Ibogaine, and uh, she actually got the FDA green light for human clinical trials at the University of Miami, applied for five different grants to fund it, and didn't get zip for any of them, 
and this woman has gotten millions of dollars in grants for a long time, so you know, I smell a rat behind that. So when you were in your presentation, you mentioned that uh, trials were, were getting preparing to get underway in Alabama. Yes. And you mentioned that there was some evidence uh, supportive of the possibility that this could be advantageous that evidently, uh, you know, supported the, uh, the, the legal approof. Uh, of those trials, and I'm wondering, has the zeitgeist changed, or what what kind of evidence did they, you know, non-clinical evidence did they present that that lended that support? Yeah, good question. Uh, I think the zeitgeist has changed. I think things are starting to loosen up a bit. Um, the so Peter Hendricks, I understand. I, I don't actually know where he gets his support from, whether it's an NIH grant um, or not, or whether he's being privately supported. So a couple of organizations like the Hefter Institute uh, support some of this work. Uh, the USONA Institute, uh, it's a, a kind of a new institute, uh, is supporting some of this work. Um, uh, th so there are there are some organizations uh, that with interested people, uh, kind of like you know maps supporting MDMA research. That's really not uh, necessarily coming through the NIH. Um, so I, th I think to your point, I think the site guys has changed. Um, the FDA can approve something, but if you don't have the money to do the trials, you're not you're not going to do it. And I'm aware of Deborah Mash's work. Um, and uh, you know some interesting results with Ibogaine um, in in addicts. Uh, I'm unaware of her funding situation, so I, I can't really answer that. Z does that answer your question pretty much? Or? Well, I was I was mainly talking about what evidence led to would the FDA approval for the kind of trial that they're planning in Alabama. Right. Well, I I I don't know what he put into his form. But I know that the FDA did approve it. It might have been other data from some of the other uh, trials. Um, I, I, I can't answer that. I, I actually don't know what data he submitted. Another question over here? So, like, pharmaceutical companies aren't interested in something you would take once in your life. So right. Who would, if this got approved, who, what, how would this get made? Who would make this? What, how would that happen? <laughs> and so you'd start, a you'd start a company? Uh, well, we, the USONA Institute, which we, we started in Madison, is kind of a, an umbrella organization that's kind of um, overseeing this trial. I don't, I don't know if USONA would provide material later. I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, one, th <laughs> one thing that I would uh, point out that uh, for phase three, so the, my laboratory is, is not what is called a GMP facility. So GMP stands for Good Manufacturing Practices. And uh, in the United States, it's not required that phase one or phase two material be made in those facilities. Now, is there any difference in the material? No. I mean, the psilocybin that comes out of a GMP facility, I mean, I would challenge them to have it as good as this psilocybin, which, but what GMP mostly is, is traceability so your balances have to be calibrated like you know twice a week or like all of the reagents have to their lot numbers have to be traceable um, you have to have a, a certain kind of electrical uh, reliability your electrical supply your air exchanges etc there are a number of kind of infrastructure um, processes that have to be met and then you're kind of audited uh, regularly and so that's really the only, it's mostly paperwork, and that's what makes GMP material so expensive because now you have this whole administrative uh, structure that, you know, kind of pushes paper around. And, um, uh, but it's good. I mean, you want it traceable. It, there's been a number of instances where some material has uh, come out of a pharmaceutical plant and caused some illness in people. There was the thing with the encephalitis a few, couple years ago, you know, and they were able to trace it like within a couple days where it came from and, you know, stopped a widespread uh, disease. So it, it, there's, there's value in it for, for sure. I, um, but 
So uh, I, I, I hope that, um, you know, there would be a company. We, we would contract. Uh, we're probably going to um, contract a, a company to make like a kilo or something. They'll use my process, uh, but it just won't be made in my laboratory um, at that point. It's, it's cheaper to hire a company to do that who's already making prescription drugs. Like they're making cough syrup, they're making acetaminophen, and you can just kind of slipstream in the psilocybin. They already have the... In <laughs> you already have the infrastructure there rather than build a brand new lab from the ground up with its millions of dollars so uh, especially if you're not you know if you make a kilo of psilocybin that's you know like a 20 year supply probably so or maybe not that long but um, but you see what I'm saying it's kind of like a once you do it once it's like what are you going to do next week <laughs> make MDMA I guess but uh, <laughs> yes um you mentioned Dr. Charles Grove yes. at UCLA. Could mm. you elucidate a little further what stage it's in and what are they studying? Well, he, he's done some work with psilocybin in cancer patients a number of years ago. Um, he's also done some work with MDMA, I, I believe. Uh, so I, I don't know exactly how far he, along, but he's, he's one of the people involved in these clinical trials. So I would, you know, encourage you to contact him. He's he's easy to contact and he's he's easy to talk to. So, if you wanted more detail, I I, I can't speak about what he's present his details about what he's presently doing. Question so right yeah. Hi. Um, as a youth growing up in Madison, Wisconsin, I had some profound experiences with uh, mushrooms and LSD, and I always had this question about um, what. Uh, changed permanently in my brain and what's the difference between change and damage and I guess my question for you is what uh, are you looking at any of those things and does the F FDA have any questions about what permanently changes in a in a brain you know uh, physically or psychologically they're kind of mixed right well I mean you know brain change it, it, you know whenever you form a memory your brain changes some, in some way I would assume and a lot of things can produce profound experiences in people sometimes it's a piece of music sometimes it's a piece of art a movie um, and so there can be you know permanent changes that occur in a person and I, I don't I wouldn't be surprised if these psychedelic agents also do that I would there's no evidence at, at all that they produce damage. Uh, the only thing I'm aware that m might be problematic is kind of heavy or long-term MDMA use. Um, but there's no evidence that psychedelics produce any kind of toxicity or damage that I'm aware of. Um, we have, you know, again, millennia of experience with these materials and you know, people that have been uh, taken them kind of routinely within their culture. You know, a psilocybin use in in, in Mexico, or ayahuasca, um, peyote use by Native Americans, uh, etc. Um, so I I don't think they're really toxic. Uh, I'm glad you grew up in Madison. We we now call it Medicine, Wisconsin, um, and um, it's a great city. Uh, you're welcome. I have a quick question. You said earlier, oh, this mirror here. Sorry. Okay. Hey, um, that you that that you were hoping that there would be some off-label prescribing for spiritual experiences or for creative pre um, problem solving. I guess that my question is, who is going to have the authority to prescribe for those types of experiences? Because that's not a typical condition that you would normally hear. Of. Well, any MD, um, presumably a visionary MD, uh, would would be. But you know, I I, I don't want to make too light. I mean, because. Uh, you know, it's these are powerful psychological agents, and I think it's crucial that people have some sort of kind of screening for like underlying um, psychological issues they might have. I don't, I don't you know, I, I, I'm not a clinician, I'm not a psychiatrist, um, but I'm just anticipating that, th you know, people that have perhaps, you know, bipolar disorder or psychosis or something, th these might be people that might not be wise uh, to take these agents because of the, the powerful changes they, that can ensue. Um, but 
So I don't know. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I'm just curious, like, I'm, I'm, as it develops, where, where who's going to be sort of responsible for saying, okay, here's a spiritual experience, this person needs this, or here's something this person's been really working on this problem, let's give them this for this. So just kind of worrying where it's going to fall in context. Yeah, well, again, if it's a prescription drug, now I, I will say that it, it, there are some prescriptions, prescription drugs that, that are kind of restricted um, that have to, like for example there's an antipsychotic drug called clozapine which produces a blood disorder not uncommonly and people that get that drug uh, have to have their blood tested I, I think it's weekly uh, for uh, this blood disorder and so it's uh, persons that prescribe that have to adhere to this program so not you know like your kind of family doc may not prescribe that or may, may not be able to um, only because of the this other concern. There are a number of other drugs, certain anti-cancer drugs, etc. But it would in general be prescribable by you know a clinician who may, maybe has some training in this area. Uh, so you know having some sort of psychedelic training program for uh, ph physicians would probably be a good idea. Um, well, you know, they say know your medicine. Another question right here. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, so far, it's been amazing. Um, I've had a, 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 an amazing time learning about this, um, and I think I've done quite a lot of learning without ever having a direct experience. Um, so if anybody can help with that, um, <laughs> see me after. Um, but that's not my question. Um, my question is we really... We have a waiting list um, <laughs> in Madison. Uh, you, you can contact uh, um, one of the people there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, no, I think that's great. Uh, my question really is, it seems to go hand in hand, um, that uh, somebody who does take this has some sort of of spiritual experience, no matter what you want to call it, how deep and how far they they go in that place. I know the FDA couldn't care less, um, but when you do these studies, do you m take off-record notes of these changes or these experiences that people may have? Well, my, I, I I don't I, I, again. I don't sit with the people myself, um, but I understand that they do take notes. Um, it, um, there, actually, the session is recorded. There's a video recording. There's a camera in the session room. And um, um, this probably won't be submitted to FDA. I, I don't know if, if it will. I, I don't see that this would be of interest to them. It might just actually be a distraction, um, at, at least for our pharmacokinetic study. Now, if it's a study involving some psychological change that you're interested in, then maybe a spiritual experience would be um, of value. But yeah, we, we do record that to my knowledge. It, it's just that I, I, I'm not in there, so I, I don't know exactly what's recorded. Hi, thanks. Hi. I have so many questions, but I'll narrow myself down. Uh, one is um, referencing a previous question, uh, uh, several questions. It has to, are there uh, body types or uh, people whose set or setting includes trauma or violence or something uh, you mentioned um, psychiatric disorders where you really feel this ex this would be you know harmful potentially so one is are there are there instances in which the psychedelic experience as described really is so disruptive um, th that's one question. And are in any of these trials, is there an effort to look at uh, people from different socioeconomic uh, backgrounds or, you know, set and setting backgrounds? And the, la the last question, though, is completely different. And that's, um, there's a lot of, there's a place called BioCurious. There's, it's kind of a hacker space or a do-it-yourself lab where people have pooled money to have their own, their own, biotechnology lab. Uh, do you imagine uh, chemistry labs? I mean, people do things in their basements, but what would it take to 
effectively make this uh, a do-it-yourself thing rather than the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, it's already there. I'm sorry. Yeah, but right. You well, know what I mean. So, how it, safe would it be to cook it up? Well, you know the uh, no the McKenna's. You know, a couple decades ago, you know, wrote the Magic Mushroom Growers Guide, and you know, college students all over the country are growing mushrooms in their dorms. Uh, <laughs> But the synthetic stuff take, does take some lab equipment and some knowledge of chemistry and how to work with the reagents, which some of them are definitely explosive and moisture sensitive. And if you ever visit my lab, if you ever visit my lab, you'll notice there's a tile missing um, over one of my uh, racks. And the reason it's missing is because something got got out of hand one day and had to be quickly quenched and it's just kind of a reminder to me to be careful uh, <laughs> but your question about does it could it bring out trauma uh, I, I believe the evidence is that th these experiences help people resolve trauma so yes they may relive a traumatic event but it brings resolution to it especially if you have a uh, a guide or a sitter who knows how to respond or help that person um, integrate that. So I didn't mention this, but you know, integration is a is a huge key um, important process to go through a a after an, one of these experiences. He, kind of leave anybody just hanging out there and, and try to do it themselves. I think it's it's good to have guidance uh, for that. Um, so. Yeah, and so what was the the middle question? The second one. Uh, uh, just whether there were oh, socioeconomic. Uh, uh, So maybe it's a question that doesn't have a question yet. Yeah, okay. Okay. Related to whether or not the trials themselves are diversified as to who comes in or whether it's, you know, healthy college students. No, right. Actually, I found out one of my students, uh, I mean, this was revealed. Yeah, yeah, anyway, no, I, I, I don't want to even, like, narrow it down that far, but... Um, um, I don't. It's not just college students. I can tell you that there's a wide variety. I mean, like both both sexes, a wide variety of ages. Uh, there's there's no um, consideration of a person's economic background, at least for the studies I'm aware of. Uh, so there's, that's not a screening uh, uh, criterion. Um, so. The, I guess the answer is kind of no at this point. Uh, uh, Dr. Cozy, uh, thank you. Thank you so much for being here. Um, very You're welcome. Yeah. A real pleasure. I'm really liking this. So I have something um, that's a question for you, but it's also a bit of a proposition to this community that's somewhat of an extension of what this um, woman was just saying and things in general. Um, so that the power, the transformative power of this work is very clear to those who are engaged with it. Um, across multiple spectrums of our culture and and um, different personalities. How do you personally feel about um, world leaders and maybe even people in, in positions of political power, maybe um, political sociopaths or CEOs or people who actually um, I'm, I'm, that, that have in a sense lost a connection to our larger family community, our, our planetary community? Um, how would you feel about this work Eventually, being you know prescribed to people who are, you know, in, as means of doing restorative justice at the highest levels of our planet. Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I mean, you know, it has to be voluntary, of course. So I can imagine like, put LSD in the water supply. You know, uh, no, that I, I, mean, of course, I'm joking. But they used, I mean, like in the '60s. I mean, that was a concern. I, I think there was this you know, kind of irrational, uh, you know, people were afraid of that and people that didn't want to have this experience. I mean, your point is well taken that there are a number of people in power that would benefit from having a more 
holistic view of the world and how we're all connected and you know but I mean, how do you do that I don't know I mean Obama at least I mean he admits to inhaling and that's the whole reason you do it he said uh, so that's good so I mean that's a, like a small step I mean it's a step up from who was it Clinton that said I didn't inhale so I mean maybe slowly over time we'll have a psychedelic president president at one point so <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, I, back in the 60s, they used LSD with terminal cancer patients in Canada. And one of the effects that they said it was good for us is a painkiller. Yes. And I was just curious if that came up and how it was framed. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, 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 exactly true. Uh, and they found that people either didn't have to take their pain meds or took a reduced dose. And it was kind of a persistent effect. I don't know if they, they, the same thing has been observed with psilocybin, but it, yes, ag agreed. Mycological trivia. When I first happened to ingest one of these um, agents back in the day, it was called Stropharia cubensis. Yes. And I'm just curious, how close did we come to your synthesizing strophaerin rather oh. than psilocybin? Um, I, I I don't know. Um, I, I mean, like I said, there's there are numerous species that produce these materials. And I I don't know what the mix would be in Strophaeria. Uh, the same, uh, yeah, Baocystin. Oh, it's just it's been renamed. Well, what was Strophaerin that you you meant? Is it just something you just made up now? Or? Oh, okay. <laughs> A trick question. I see, okay. So it's the same substances. So, okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, a, a comment that maybe you can comment on. I, I think one, one thing that seems to come up, and I've been in a few of these presentations, and I, I'm actually not getting this feeling in response to you, as I have in past presentations sometimes, where uh, a concern bubbles up that the uh, medical system is co-opting an experience. And um, I think the insight that I got in listening to you tonight is they can co-opt it. It doesn't mean that the underground experience will disappear. That can continue in whatever form it, that it does. but. Just the, the medical model co-opting is a concern that I think comes up a lot in these conversations. I mean, this, this work is extremely important. It has a, an amazing positive impact on the people involved. But there's this control issue that's very disturbing sometimes. Mm. And, um, and I just want to say that I, I, I once heard uh, a Native American woman talk about cooking for her community and family and the experience of putting love in the food when she was cooking and how important that was. And um, I, I kind of get that from you. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So um, I have a, a more pragmatic question. So um, I saw that the Silicon Valley has a lot of interest make a move into the biotech. So um, is there any possibility of some kind or interest of some kind of collaboration? Because I saw that a lot of people in the Valley, they are interested in moonshot projects that might not be taken by the normal uh, pharmaceuticals, but it might be embraced by Google. And I saw there are a lot of interest for those uh, uh, creative people in, in the, uh, who are also very powerful and rich that's to see this compound being approved. So, and perhaps you guys can even u utilize their lobbying power to further loosen things up a little bit. So, I, I see there are a lot of potential of, of that type of collaboration and can really make the world better because they are the ones who will give you access to the rich and powerful, the CEOs and all those. So, then it will be a win-win strategy. So, any, uh, it, any possibility about that? Give him my phone number. Uh, <laughs> No, I, I think we, we do have some uh, sponsors who are committed and have pretty deep pockets um, at this point. I mean, I think it's at, at least for now, it's like money's not an issue. 
Um, it's it's really kind of moving methodically through the FDA process. I mean, we're kind of working closely with them. We also have a, a consulting uh, company that we're we're consulting with. There, and it includes people who used to work for big pharma like um, Novartis and Pfizer, etc. And so they're giving us guidance on what's needed. Like, uh, and and there's 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 tons of documents on the FDA site to what kind of uh, chemistry and what kind of facilities uh, that one needs to do. But, I mean, that said, um, I think it's always useful to have more people who have access to resources to support the work. When we get into the phase three studies, they're going to be very expensive. And, you know, if you're talking at least hundreds of patients, if not thousands, then you need there's a whole team there must be 50 people actually that are working with us at UW in addition to that small team I showed you and this is just for 12 people so you multiply these people all have to be paid to you know come into work uh, they're coming in on weekends you know we have nurses we have staff uh, medical devices these are expensive so uh, I don't think we would turn down any Google money but um, you know so Spread the word. Hi. Uh, having spoken with a few people that note uh, a marked contrast in different um, cultivars or varieties of different types of these mushrooms, um, I'm wondering if you see any, valuable, any value in um, either underground or above ground research on the Bayesistin and Norbayesistin because... Uh, my concern and my question is like, are, are we doing research with uh, the correlation being like the THC when we should be doing research or could be doing research with the CBD compound? Like there's, right, right. Uh, there are obviously other compounds in there that could potentially be more active or more applicable to what we're studying. I'm wondering. It's, it's entourage. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, absolutely. I, 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 I think that's a great idea. And I think, I mean, I mean, I kind of like a, one of the projects back in the pipeline for me personally is to, because it's the same chemistry really to make the uh, Bayosystin and uh, nor Bayosystin might be a little trickier, um, but, um, but yeah, there's interest in, in, in that um, and maybe having some like combination or just even the single agents on their own. I, I am unaware of any work that's been done well, with those in people, like a systematic study. I mean, probably Hoffman uh, tried these at one point, but um, Paul, did you have any insight on that? Or uh, So, uh, yeah, a great idea. And I mean, if people can access these in the underground, you know, a lot of... Uh, good stuff comes out of the stuff that's below the radar a lot of good good information and are they ah hmm not to my knowledge i mean usually so what happens uh you know for things that aren't specifically scheduled um they have this thing called the analog act you may be familiar with which is like you know really the uh uh, what word can I use? Let's say it's a poor piece of legislation, but it, it's so vague that, I mean, you can make it, you know, it's like, what? Yeah, it, um, and so they would, uh, if it were, if it became distributed, like let's say, you know, somebody came across some Bayosystem and started distributing it, then it then it pops up on the radar, and then, you know, if DEA uh, finds out, then they'll try to, if it gets big enough, they'll try to shut it down, and and they will uh, pursue somebody under the Analog Act and say it's an analog of psilocybin. So just keep it close to the vest. <laughs> um, I have a question. Has there been any uh, clinical research into um, uh, a subtherapeutic dose or microdosing? Oh, great question. Yeah, you, you're like right on it. Um, so yeah, there is some interest in it. And so you know, microdosing was first used with LSD. You know, it's kind of supposedly a sub-perceptual dose, a 10 microgram. Uh, many people can even feel 10. Uh, but um, 
But so the idea is like, oh, what's a sub-threshold dose of psilocybin? Maybe it's one of these two milligram, you know, Sandoz things. And uh, actually, Emmanuel Schindler, the woman I mentioned who's at Yale uh, with a cluster of headaches, their, uh, um, their study is a, a supposedly a microdose study of psilocybin. Now, I don't know exactly what the do those doses will be, but um, so it, it's possible that there might be some benefit at, you know, at a non-psychedelic dose. Uh, I, totally reasonable, totally fascinating. Hi, um, I work with young adults that were recently uh, diagnosed with schizophrenia, hmm. and a lot of them are having very profound spiritual experiences like you had listed on that first slide. And I was wondering if there is any research or planned research around if this could actually be helpful or harmful to someone, especially if they went and were given the guidance and the integration after. Yeah, uh, good question. Well, some of the early LSD research was in, uh, pe in, in, in people who had schizophrenia. Uh, I, uh, there's not, to my knowledge, there are no planned studies at present uh, with these materials. So uh, I guess the answer is no. Uh, could they be beneficial? Maybe. Um, I, I I don't I don't know if they would be or not. Any other? Um, are we running out of time? We are. We're, we are running out of time. I have one question, Nick. Um, just in terms of envisioning the future, what would you like to see happen in the ideal world? Um, in terms of Psychedelic healing medicine research. Well, I, I believe, like Roland mentioned, that these materials and these experiences are, can be of great benefit to people. And um, I would like to see people have access to these experiences. Um, you know, uh, probably not children, maybe, uh, you know, responsible adults. Uh, um, you know, if they could have these kinds of experiences in a safe setting a safe container uh, with support, um, I, I think people could benefit. I mean, there, there's so much uh, evidence out there that people do benefit from these experiences, and I, I think really healthy people should have access to these. So that's what I'd like to see in the future. Awesome. Thank you. Thank Let's you. Let's give Nick a round of applause. Thank you. Thank you.